it's quite early in the morning and I appreciate it that you took the time to talk this early. I'm talking today to Maria Fusco, who had a lecture performance or film screening lecture performance yesterday at the Kunsthalle within the framework of what would Thomas Bernhard do. Maria Fusco is a writer, an editor, and crea curator, and artist. I'm not a curator. Artist. I'm not a curator. You're not a curator? No. no. All right. <coughs> and I'm not an artist. Well, I used to we be. Can... <laughs> <laughs> I see. You're currently based in Glasgow, but mm. you have lived in London for quite some time yes. and taught there at Goldsmiths. Mm -hmm. And um, in contrast to most writers, who mostly give a quite detailed account on biographical details. Uh, I found very little information about you, so could you shortly uh, tell us uh, what you have studied and how it came that you wanted to be a writer, or didn't you, or maybe you didn't want to be a writer and you just <laughs> slipped into it, so yes. what is your history, your earlier history? Okay, um, I'm from uh from Belfast in Northern Ireland originally and I'm from a very working class mm -hmm. background so there was no expectation, the expectation of work, of one's work uh, had to do with how one could earn money off one's work right. rather than how one might um, not deliberately <laughs> not earn money from one's work. Um, my father, I'm half Italian, mm -hmm. so my father was very old when I was born, um, but was a very skilled craftsman, uh, as many Italians do, they work in terrazzo and in marble, mm -hmm. and it's a very mm -hmm. embodied craft and skill that is not particularly seen, particularly at that time, as, as a creative practice, but just again as a, as a means to uh, earning money. And I think that these things have been important in terms of, of informing uh, how I find my own ways and methods of working. I trained at art school in the north of England, so I grew up in Belfast during the war in Belfast. It was really awful, so I wanted to escape as quickly as possible from there. And I moved to the north of England and studied in art school, um, which I enjoyed, but I always felt very dissatisfied at making objects and felt um, that the objects were unnecessary, uh, an unnecessary uh, manifestation at the end of a sort of period of production. During that time I was always writing as well, and writing a lot, but didn't equate the writing practice in a sense as a, um, as a sort of, didn't, didn't think that the writing was a practice, perhaps that's the easiest way to say it. But the writing was very important in terms of perhaps the writing created an imbalance with the object making because it, the, the writing was always more interesting for me and I found that the writing for myself was more active and um, could, uh, was, I felt I did more work with the writing. So eventually over years <laughs> my art practice and my writing practice found a different sort of a balance. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I was quite a successful artist, which was bad, because it meant that it took me quite a long time to give up making art. And I think that I wanted to, but because I, because I was validated, it was very difficult for me to then decide not to, to, to stop making art. I'll tell you very quickly, because it's, I think it's interesting about how people from class find places like art schools. I used to get the number 93 bus with my mother into the city centre of Belfast and there was a very big building and the art school in Belfast is, um, is one of the only sort of, well I say modernist, a sort of quasi-modernist building but it's very unique in Belfast, very tall and very clean looking. And one day when I was about maybe six or seven, we were on the bus and there was a man coming out of the art school and he was carrying a gigantic uh, lipstick that was made uh, from papier-mâché and it was huge and he was carrying it <laughs> and I was really impressed by this and thought it was astonishing the absurdity and the sort of theatricality of it and the colour I suppose 
And I said to my mother, I said, I said, what, what is that? What is that? But like, not really, I'm sure I didn't word it like this, but you know, what is that place? And she said, it's art. My mother said, it's <laughs> art school, yes. That's great. <laughs> and I said, I, you know, I want to go there. But I think that the reason why I went to art school rather than, for example, regular school, mm -hmm. was because I saw it was a building and it had a door and you could go into it. I think that I, I think that had there been, for example, a writer school, which also had that level of visibility about it, I think I probably would have gone there rather but than art would, school. Would there have been one? In yes, of course there was. It was just I never went past okay. it on the bus. Okay, it's coincidence. Yes. <laughs> um, well, but during your studies, of, yeah. what did you study? Uh, sculpture or painting? Sculpture. Mm -hmm. You probably all already read quite a, you know, distinct pieces of literature? No, you, not really. Not really? No, I, um, <clears throat> I started reading when I went to art school, well I could read obviously. Wow, um, was a lot. Uh, yes, uh, very little. Uh, uh, I, um, I watched a lot of television mm -hmm. um, and a, a lot of my current work is very influenced by the films that I saw on television when I was growing mm -hmm. up. Um, so mainly I watched television, I didn't read a lot of literature. Because I saw you, you, you published a kind of, in Freeze magazine, I think it was yes. in Freeze magazine, you published a kind of a, you know, um, um, a list, mm. syllabus, yes. um, of, you know, uh, your fa basically your favorite literary works. Yeah. And, and my favorite American writer is Donald Balthony, yes, whom you yes. know probably. And he speaks of a genealogy of, of father figures. That, yes. I mean, it's his special hunch yes, because yes. his father was a very dominant yes. architect and stuff. But he speaks of a kind of gen genealogy of fathers, mm -hmm. every right, maybe it's mothers, I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> and what, what are your fathers in this sense of the word? In literature mm -hmm. or in my own work? In your own work. It's mainly filmmakers. All right. Yes. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> I think it's probably mainly filmmakers. Um, I, think that the, I think that my literary influences and my sort of, let's say, critical or theoretical influences um, come after the, the film influences, let's say. Um, so, um, with the, uh, maybe it's easier to start with the literary references. So, on that ideal syllabus, the book which I said that was the most important for me is the Irish author Flann O'Brien's The Third Policeman. Um, uh, of course, Flann O'Brien is more well known for his book at Swim Two Birds, which is an amazing um, uh, <laughs> metalyptic, uh, self-reflexive, bizarre novel. Um, Flano Brown's combination of, of his use of, of history and mythology, in addition to the high level of the, the high frequency of the writing, is very appealing to me. Um, uh, what's a bit depressing, but also emotionally appealing about uh, Flano Brown, of course, as well, is that really he only ever wrote two really good books, and all of the other books are notations or addendums to the two main books, probably because he was an alcoholic and his head began to disperse. Um, so in a sense, I think maybe the literature, um, it wasn't that I never read anything, but I wasn't, I wasn't typical in that I was a very bookish child. Um, there were, there, for instance, there were lots of books in the house because there weren't a lot of books in the house. Both of my parents were incredibly intelligent, but very poor and very, uh, very poorly educated actually uh, so we didn't have the we didn't have the paraphernalia of of learning in a sense so um, television was very important to me because um, and I still I think I still believe this that in the sense that things have don't have their own value that they that they have the value which you give to them through critical inquiry um, the television that I would have watched um, when I was growing up, ranged from really terrible, you know, awful, uh, very poorly made, you know, soap operas, etc., to really amazing films. So, for instance, the film that I um, screened last night is a film called Temrock, made in 1973. Um, and that was one of the first films that was ever on a new channel um, in, in the UK. And in Northern Ireland, we had English television, which, of course, had a very sort of specific... Uh, a very specific political uh, remit, um, but Temrock was Temrock was one of the first films that was ever on channel this this new channel, which at that time was more left leaning and showed a lot of art house films. It's changed subsequently, 
and it had a special rating on it, which was a red triangle. And the red triangle meant that it had sexual content in it. So, of course, to a sort of 12 year old, it was very appealing to watch the, you know, the red triangle film. Um, but I think, I think this sort of completeness of watching everything on television was actually very important to me in terms of how to sort and how to find one subject. And that's something which I am con um, uh, continue to be interested in, in terms of um, in terms of developing a patriarchy or let's say a matriarchy of one's work. In a sense, it's it's not it's it's not led by role models. In a sense, it's led more by a, a, a critical, um, let's say, a kind of a criticality of a way of looking. Um, and there is also something of the dilettante about that, of course which I want to retain, want to retain the sense of the amateur to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's quite common with people who have moved from one discipline Well, I did that another. too, so um, I know what you're talking about. Do you about. agree? With yes, I, well, dilettantism... Uh, autodidactic? Bit of a, yeah, autodidactic. It's a bit of a carquetry because after, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you've been working in writing for 10 years or 15 years. Yes, yes. It's hard to maintain yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. that you're a dilettante, but, but, yes. but autodidactism would yes. be the, the good I one. like the idea of amateur. I think the yeah, idea sure. of the amateur is a good one. Sure. And um, so your, your uh, interest in art criticism did develop at art school, I suppose, or yes. at, at, uh, in, at, in, the, in, in the face of critics looking at your sculptures, I guess. I think with, I think actually, I think it, it slightly preceded that, but I didn't have a term for it. So uh, there's a museum in Belfast called the Ulster Museum, which for some reason has an excellent collection of modern art. I don't know why, there obviously was one person who bought a lot. And um, <clears throat> I think I used to go there with my father a lot because it was free. Um, and it was, you know, a big museum full of things and it was very cold outside, so it was, you know, it's very practical. Um, and we used to discuss various objects that were in the gallery. And one of the objects was Henry Moore's oval with points, which I, which I saw in the same way as I saw, for example, a stuffed elk, or I sort of saw them all the same. But that, again, to return to this idea of a kind of, crit a, a kind of cri cr criticality, in a sense, rather than criticism, perhaps, is, mm -hmm. is for me a slightly more useful term. So what would term. you, what is the difference? Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> I, know I don't want to be I know. impolite, no, no, but no, no, I, I was, no, no, I think, I, I'm a translator yes, too, so yes, I'm yes. always <laughs> no, I think having these yes, problems. It's, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think I'm probably worried about saying criticism now, at this moment, at this moment in time, um, because I think particularly with having worked on the programme at Goldsmiths, Art writing was deliberately, um, my idea, let's say, of art writing in terms of how I worked with the students was deliberately kept always in a future tense, in an idea of what art writing might be rather than trying to define what it currently was. But clearly it was necessary to, to develop some ways of talking about or defining what it was in order to allow space for what it might become. So in that sense, Critical writing, as, as perhaps slightly distinct from criticism, seems to be a more speculative, speculative way um, and frees one perhaps from more of an art historical uh, sort of tra uh, backwards trajectory. So it, that is why this practice is then uh, more leaning towards experimental writing in a certain sense. Perhaps, perhaps so, I think, but I think, of course, one needs to be aware, one needs to um, be aware of one's predecessors in order to be able to, to make such, such distinctions that we're discussing now, yes. and it would be, it would be foolhardy and silly uh, not to have, not to have read, not to have looked and read extensively, and also, again, with my, with my television viewing as a child, let's say, what was important about it was reading every was was watching everything. So in a sense, for me, there's an idea of reading everything mm -hmm. in order to be able to make comparative, personal, subjective evaluations mm -hmm. um, within within a, a field of practice and to have an overview in a sense of a field of practice. 
Uh, however, this is slightly complexified by then trying to make decisions about where one's work is situated within a field of practice. Um, and I would suggest that that is best left for other people to do and not for oneself to do. I understand. But the, the uh, entire idea of um, looking at as many writing styles and, and assimilating as many writing styles as possible mm -hmm. finally led to your uh, uh, editing of a you, you call it journal, mm. an art journal, yes, which yes. is called The Happy Hypocrite. Yes. Could you talk a bit about uh, the time when you founded that and how long it took you yes. to be able to found it and to, to get the right orientation yes. to do it? The Happy Hypocrite um, is a semi-annual journal, it's quite twice a year. I used to say biannual, but then that could mean twice a year or every second year, which, which of course I find very irritating and confusing. <laughs> Um, well, it's confusing. It's my idea, you know, kind of a marketing, <laughs> marketing thing. Yes. <laughs> confused. Um, and confused. The uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the title is stolen from uh, an English satirist called Max Beerbohm, who wrote um, a, a little short, quite poor, little short um, parable or little fable. It is um, important. But it is quite poor. It is quite poor, yes. It's not, um, you know, and often I'm very inclined to, I, I like things which are quite poor, um, because I, again, I like sort of finding, I yeah. like finding value in, in rubbish to a certain extent. Um, I find that appealing and also very interesting. Um, so the, the journal in this, yes, the journal, the title is taken from that and the character, there is a reason why I'm telling you this, the character in the short story um, is evil and then falls in love with um, a sort of saintly woman, has a mask manufactured for his face, which, which is a saintly mask, which he wears for many years. Um, and then um, because he wants to appear, you know, saintly for his love. And then um, towards the end of the story, someone, a prostitute, evil from the past um, comes and removes his mask but behind his mask his own face has become saintly because he has been living the life of a saint for so long and this struck me as an interesting um, slightly uh, you know it's it's slightly too neat but as an idea an interesting um, starting point for um, beginning to think how one's how, uh, how one can only develop let's say a practice or a subject area or a discourse or a constituency of writers or readers through actually doing it. And that the that the in a sense this, as maybe Latour would say, this um, simultaneity of forms, it can only work um, through actual practice. So there can't be a distinction between the the obviously between the form and the content, but also between the kind of discourse of the form and the form itself. For me it's important that they that they act together, that they're embedded within each other. The journal was um, the journal is a way of the journal is a way of trying to put this into practice and in quite a practical way actually, uh, of providing a providing um, a, a sort of well distributed um, international publication, half of which half to three quarters of which is open submission, so people find it, and half of to a quarter, whatever, of it is me inviting people in order to try and establish some coordinates about what might be possible with the production that, uh, that appears in it. Um, I have an idea in a sense that um, much of the work that I have done um, is, is interested in inviting people to join in uh, rather than trying to kind of force people <laughs> to join in. Um, it tries to um, make visible certain modes of, of, of practice um, and, in, and, and then um, it try to, tries to make them better, to sharpen them through practice. And for me this sort of um, extra disciplinary way of working um, seems to, it seems to find its own audience mm -hmm. because people, people are looking for it. Of course there are other journals which, uh, magazines, historically and contemporary journals which do this as well and there's plenty of space for all of us to do it together because you know there's there's actually quite a lot of people who are writing in ways within contemporary art etc who don't necessarily want to want to produce work which is which is tied to a particular time 
in terms of review writing or, or more traditional forms of art criticism and want, um, want something which, is, which moves across time perhaps in a slightly different way. Um, I talked to friends also about Happy Hypocrite. I mean, as far as the information is concerned that I was able to get because yeah. I didn't have a copy. Yeah. But, you should have let um, me know about this, actually. And uh, <laughs> um, I find it quite interesting also because you say that uh, there is a reference to this uh, Happy Hypocrite book uh, with a mask mm -hmm. and uh, there was a certain consensus that it's a very British uh, uh, okay. style. Yes, because I think you couldn't possibly find the market for it in, in Vienna, certainly not in Vienna, it's yes, probably yes. too small, yes. but maybe not even in New York. Yes. So there is a kind of a, a dandyist mm. uh, streak. That's interesting, because obviously I'm not English. So yes, that's, that's why I, that's what I, 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 I got, I got the group in bold letters, don't say British, but you know there's... Well, I am technically, I, unfortunately, I am technically British, I'm a British citizen. I'm not even I a full British person, I'm a British citizen. Yes, no, that's interesting, yes. Uh, yes, do you, do you, do you, how do you relate to the classic dentist writing like Beau Brummel and, and, and 19th century? Or is there not a point of reference to you? Really, not at all. Honest, no, not okay. really. Um, what I can say about the journal, that's a very interesting point, and I'll, I'll go away. I'll have to, that's the first time I've heard that observation, so it's very interesting. I need to maybe, perhaps it's something to do with the sort of sense of, perhaps there's something about the sense of humour in it, perhaps, which is quite yes. English, perhaps, actually. Although I, I mean, I am not English, but perhaps there's something about the, the absurdist quality of the sense of humour in it, which again comes from watching lots of English comedy. <laughs> Um, perhaps there is that. The journal um, is produced in an edition of 2000 um, and the first ones have, have you know, largely sold out now. And I find that obviously I'm, qu I'm very proud of that and I'm pleased but I'm also always slightly puzzled by it because I don't know who buys it. You know, and so what is your major outlet for? It's it's sold internationally. So in, in bookstores. And bookstores, yeah. galleries, obviously the pub the publishers. It's published by Bookworks in London. Mm -hmm. The publishers um, go to fairs with it. Um, sometimes it might sell. Obviously, if someone who's involved in it has a specific show, etc. But mainly, it just sells through. People take a subscription out to it, so it sells through like that. I mean, the funny thing about producing books, as you'll know, as you'll know yourself in writing, is that you never really see people looking at them. So I can never really be well, sure. Well, I don't. Maybe you do. I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't. No, I don't. No. No. So I'm never, I'm never really sure that anyone's actually read them. Yeah, you, you can know? never be sure. No. Well. No, and I find that interesting. I find it in, um, I find it interesting. You know, and perhaps with a, with a, a journal, perhaps is different than, for instance, my book of short stories, Mechanical Coppola. The book I have, or sorry, with the journal, I have more of a sense of response, an editorial response responsibility for the people who I've invited and collaborated with to produce the work and of course it is their work in my journal in that sense it's their work it's not my work in that way so you have to frame it uh, in a way that is not insulting to people uh, not, not, you not really that just that I would perhaps find it easier I'm a very shy person so I find it quite difficult to be very uh, yes my work is absolutely <laughs> amazing I find it quite difficult to be like that but I don't find it difficult to be like that, for instance, with the journal mm -hmm. or, for instance, with the programme that I used to run or, or work like that. But I find it quite difficult to be like that with my own work. Not because I don't think the work has value or is interesting, but simply because I was brought up with a certain, with a certain, um, certain way to move in the world, which was not to be all... Uh, pushing everyone aside, it was to wait in, in a certain place. So the sort of there's a persist, there's a there's a, a, a self-critical persistence, let's say, about my own writing, um, but not not I would f I would f I would feel very embarrassed about being all about my own work, my own act, my own writing. Um, but I would I don't feel like that about other projects because I feel I have to mm -hmm. one has to have a kind of a creative vision in order to be able to be visible enough to invite people to to join in. So the 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 formal 
institutional framework somehow gives you space to, to behave in ways which you couldn't do easily with your own work yes. in a kind of a more fluid situation. I suppose, yes, that's probably true. I really don't like admitting that, uh, but I suppose it's probably well, true. Is it I suppose it probably is true. Just facts? I suppose so, but, you know, uh, again, being Northern Irish, Northern Irish people are sort of an odd mm -hmm. sort of people. The half, you know, half of them, especially in Catholic Northern Irish, uh, working class Catholic, half of my personality is very orientated towards being quite good at being told what to do. So I'm very good, if I'm invited to write for something, I write exactly the correct word count, the script is exactly clean and I always get it in on time. And I have to. I always have to. I do that too, by the well, way. So it's, yeah. <laughs> that's, maybe how, that's maybe the reason why I was struck by a very little remark you gave in, a, in, a, in an interview. Maybe it's a very, you know, ephemeral remark, I don't know. It's uh, that you were kind of obsessed with social class. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and naturally this led me to uh, the dandyism. <laughs> yes. Opposite. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and 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 but in what way are you obsessed? In, in, I mean, I don't I don't see it in your writing directly. It's no. not that you. In my in my fiction writing, it appears uh -huh. it appears more in the fiction writing. I think it probably. Hmm, I think it. I I feel it does appear in the writing, not necessarily in terms of subject, but actually it does appear in subject in the fiction writing. And for example, I've just completed. Uh, this novella, which is called Sailor, which is um, it's written it's written from the point of view of a monkey, <laughs> in and it's set in Belfast in nineteen forty one, so during the Second World War in Belfast, um, and it's it's written in phonetic Northern Irish dialect of that period, working class dialect. So it it, it the actual formation. So you invented a kind of yes. script. Of that. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. It took quite a long time. Yes. It was a completely stupid idea. It was the first. It was the first. Um, it was the first work of that length that I completed, you know, of that type and of that length, um, and it's written phonetically. So it, you know, it it's it was stupid, but I felt that I had to write it. But in terms of class, that deals very directly in terms of the actual phonetic and dialectical fabric, dialectic and dialectical fabric of the work is very much mm -hmm. concerned with class. It's trying to represent, um, it, well, it's trying to embody perhaps rather than represent, but inevitably it, it, it has a re representational qualities. Uh, it's trying to, uh, to, to, find, uh, to find an accent which is mainly now, now lost. That's saying, and also lost to myself to a certain extent. Clearly, I still have my own accent, but much of it is lost. Th not much, a little of it is lost through um, working out, you know, working outside of Northern Ireland and working, speaking to yourself. It's different. Obviously, I speak differently to you than I would to, you know, of course. Yeah. But, I appreciate yes, this, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that I think that class. I think that my work is very imbued with the concerns of social mobility, and I think that the forefronting uh, of the of the subjective critical voice is very very much very much speaks to my interest in class, because the subjective voice in the terms of Spivak, the subaltern voice, of course, is is the voice which cannot speak. So one must find one must find how to speak, um, and one must find how to speak in a way which is, which is accurately critical. Let's say, and that's something which does concern me, and I I believe that that that, that concern does grow from from this. Uh, from being to to a certain extent an auto I don't want to over egg the autodidact because clearly that would be you know silly and it's not true but there is a little element of truth in that in terms of having no archetypes to look to there is there is a little bit of that and finding educational structures which help one to uh, improve one's one's learning. Now I understand the, 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 what you mean by the difference of uh, between criticality. And criticism. So, so criticality is more like um, destabilizing uh, your own 
point of yes. view and your own point of you know of you in terms of writing and yes. style. Yes, one should one, one should never be sure. I think yes. um, I I strongly feel that I strongly feel that it's the strongest intellectual position never to be sure. Of course, emotionally, that's a very negative position to, to feel in, but inevitably the two must be linked. But it's, uh, I mean, it's linked to honesty. Yes, yes. And honesty is healthy. Yes, yes. <laughs> it might not sell, you know. <laughs> no, 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 I, I completely agree. I, I completely agree. It is, it is linked to honesty. It is linked to honesty. But, but interestingly, again, I think that... Um, I think that it's it's quite difficult to admit, in a sense, it's quite difficult to admit as a positive point that one cannot, but that one chooses not to be sure, or that one yes. is not sure. Yeah. It's difficult to admit yeah. that if, if one does a lot of events nationally, internationally, etc. It's difficult to say that because it seems to be it seems to be a, a negative or a pejorative characteristic. Yeah, or coquetry. I mean, people, you know, say, well, she's there and she obviously has the credits to be there. And then yes. she's saying, uh, yes. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether I yes. am allowed to be here. Yes. So that yes. might be, you know, interpreted as coquetry. Yes. But it's not, obviously. No, in well, sense I, I don't Because see. it's uh, molded into your whole practice. Yes. Of, I completely understand what you mean. Sorry, uh, in that sense, just to finish that, in that sense, maybe there's an idea that that's a, for myself, something of a, yes, it's a way of proceeding through the world, let's mm. say. Yeah, great. Narvatus, when, when will you do? per day, um, um. I advance by pointing to my mask. Yes. The advance is the important thing and the, uh, yeah. the pointing to the mask. I see. Mm -hmm. when, when will your book be out? The I'm Seder. not sure. I have to find, um, I have to find a publisher. Uh, I, I think it's a literary project rather than an art project. Um, and it's an unsellable literary project, you know. It's, Are we in the same position? Because it's, uh, <laughs> I have an unsellable book too, which I wrote obsessively, and it's ugly. It's what is it? What is it? <laughs> it's kind of you know a, a utopia, which is not, which is unclear. Mm. Uh, uh, you don't know whether it's this topic or a utopic. Mm. Oh yeah. So it's oh, that's very sexy. bureaucratic. What's it called? The network orange. Ah. <laughs> 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 so, well, uh, there are some more questions, but I'm not sure whether do we have enough. Well, it's qu well, we've got another 15 minutes. Do we have another 15 yeah, minutes? Yeah, it's past. What do you say? 10, excuse me. Because I could talk it's a quite con concentrated up till now. And I, I, mean, yeah, I've, uh, I could the, talk a little bit. I'm working on another book about the actor Donald Sutherland, which, if you like, I could talk about briefly, only yeah. because I think, ah. some, I'm only saying that because I think actually it's relevant to some of what we've been talking about, and it also... Yeah, and also the film. Uh, that's the it, film. that's it. Okay, then, then I uh, ask a pseudo-question. <laughs> <laughs> let me ask, uh, yes. let me ask an in-depth, inquisitory question. Yes. You said that your uh, uh, <laughs> writing comes from a filmic background, yes. and I heard that you uh, wrote a book about uh, Donald Sutherland. Could you explain this? Please? Yes, uh, yes. Um, I'm working on a book at the moment uh, of experimental essays and fictions around 10 film roles of the comedian actor Donald Sutherland. Um, I've chosen... Uh, Congrats. Thank you. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. I'm um, <clears throat> slightly obsessed with Donald Sutherland. Always have been. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I find that sort of quite shameful in a way, but obviously I don't find it that shameful because I wouldn't work on a project. But the sort of slight embarrassment about, about the subject, how one finds one's subject, is very is very important part of the, of, the, of the writing process, actually, and sort of it's part of the project. Uh, so it, it's ten, 10 films from 1970 to 1980. I've chosen that time period because I like the way he looks during that time period. <laughs> Slightly. Um, but also it's a very interesting it's a very interesting period in his career. So obviously there are films like Don't Look Now, Nova Cento, um, Clute, uh, Mash and films like that. And then there are also films like Kentucky Fried Movie and Animal House and sort of ones which are <clears throat> perhaps maybe one might less associate with an art house, sort of an actor. Um, and uh, so I've watched all of those films during that period and then make a selection and then write with 
uh, ranked with 10 and each will have a form which is suggested somehow by the film. So it won't be a concurrent form, but there will be an idea of a sort of <clears throat> simultaneity of the form with it. Um, what interests me in that project is, is again, returning to some films which I remember. And in my book of short stories, Mechanical Coppola, the, short, the, the title story is written from um, a scene towards the end of Fellini's Casanova, with Donald Sutherland as Casanova, um, dancing with a, a mechanical doll and then having sex with a mechanical doll. So that, that I, in a sense, I've tested that way of writing and find it to be interesting. Um, there's something about the project which has to do, yes, with this, with an idea of embarrassment, but it, but perhaps more importantly than that for other people, um, an idea of how one finds, how one locates and finds one's subject, uh, and this is something which interests me um, in regards to what we were talking a little bit about earlier about um, how one finds one's voice. And in a sense, one find, uh, I find my voice through subject. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in that, but I can only speak for myself. So there's something interesting about this project. But the project is inevitably, I think, going to fail. Because, um, so for instance, when I, it, I've done some readings of the, and I like to show the relevant piece of the film beforehand and then do the reading after. And inevitably the reading always seems a little limp compared to, to the film. <laughs> that is due to the yes. uh, medium. Absolutely. And again, that, that interests me. That really inter it interests me in terms of the disappointment of listening, perhaps, um, and also the, the, the lack of completeness about writing, which is something that, again, intellectually is very interesting, but perhaps emotionally uh, less appealing. Mm -hmm. Um, in the in the films in the films that I'm I'm kind of working with, it's interesting to note how a, a gesture which appears in an early film will develop and mutate in a completely different context in a later film. So there's something of a there's something in the Donald Sutherland project. It's it's commissioned by um, a gallery in Scotland called Collective, and it will be published as a book. But I'm also trying to get Donald Sutherland to come to. Scotland next year for a film fest, which looks like it might happen. So that would be another sort of odd layer, layering of, of... So the idea would be that Donald Sutherland would do the reading, probably. I hope so. I That's hope he would. I hope he would. It would be a satisfying loop. Mm -hmm. But of course he might hate the work. Or, you know, think I'm a loony. <laughs> which is, you know... Uh, which is, you know, uh, can probably quite well justified. He's an artist as well, I think. <laughs> well, he's been in he's been in a Rebecca Horn film called Buster's mm -hmm. Bedroom, and um, and I think that the, I think certainly in that it certainly in some of the you know there there there's a there's a definite there's a frequency of performance there's a frequency of his performance which has which which sits outside of the outside of the films which he's in and it probably has to do with physicality etc as well but i think there is something of a frequency of performance which sits outside which is which is interesting in terms of trying to locate this subject and then and then track how the subject is knitted into various plots right thank you very much for your thank you